Welcome, welcome. We're, we're, we're glad to have such a such a big crowd. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, Medina World War II Roundtable. Um, it's it's very satisfying to remember the uh, the days when we started, where the library said if we couldn't have five or six people regularly, then they'd have to get us a smaller room. So, so this is uh, uh, this is wonderful. I'd also like to to. Uh, um, remind the, uh, the folks that have been coming a long time and, and politely ask uh, newcomers that if you haven't signed the, uh, the sign-in sheet in the back, uh, please do so. It helps us a lot to know uh, how many folks we have. I promise no sales calls will be made on that information, so if you could sign that, that would be wonderful. Um, we're going to go ahead and begin tonight. Now, I will, I will warn you, I think we've got it taken care of. Uh, Larry, who is normally our orchestra leader for the National Anthem, uh, he has a, a terrible struggle trying to see as much of Alaska as he can by boat and train. So he won't be with us this time. Uh, hopefully he will be back next month. So I'm going to ask you to rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> and the next I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. Well, again, welcome. We are we are delighted to have uh, with us this evening uh, Monica Pan. Um, Monica was uh, was born in Germany uh, during the turmoil of the war. Uh, some of her earliest memories are of a uh, desperate struggle to to escape the Red Army uh, as they smashed west towards Germany. Um, since her father was MIA and her mother was a, uh, a scientist and sent uh, by Hitler to the Ukraine. Uh, she grew up in, in a couple different foster homes. Uh, she was able to reunite with her mother, um, but uh, not, not until 1959 uh, in America. Uh, she now has two children of her own and seven grandchildren. Uh, she is retired uh, and lives in, in Florida, um, but enjoys spending her summers here in Ohio. And, uh, she has written a book uh, beyond my wildest dreams, uh, a girl's, uh, a German girl's uh, story of, of World War II and beyond. Uh, please join me in welcoming Monica Tan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It was quite an introduction. Um, originally, I'm going to walk around a little bit, and I think I have a loud enough voice. I used to be a senior high school teacher, and I had, because I have a heavy broke, I had to speak very, very loudly, and so I think all of you will be able to hear me. Now, originally, I just wrote my memoirs for my children and my grandchildren because they should know what their mother went through, what their oma, went, their grandmother went through because nowadays the children, they have everything served on a nice silver platter and they do not know what our hardships are and what difficulties I went through. So originally, I self-published this myself and um, some pictures in the back, but then a professor or somebody from the university got hold of this book and they said, you need to publish a library book. You need to, to really publish because that is so interesting. And so I went back to work and I did some more editing and I put in there at least about 100 photos. Oh and uh, so I, I am so surprised. I give a lot of talks in Florida. I'm a Floridian. Only spent my summers at the lake home, Lake Milton. And uh, yes, and uh, so, I, uh, so many people are interested in this book. It's amazing. I have a lot of different groups 
who want to hear about my story. Now, um, many of you don't really know what is a dictatorship, and especially a dictatorship under Adolf Hitler. It was bad, especially towards the end of the war. Um, there was no freedom of speech. And I could not stand up here and criticize anything about what Hitler is doing or about the Reich or the regime. And because the next morning I would be so afraid that somebody of you, somebody will report me. And the next morning at 5 o'clock, the SS is at the door, no question asked, and take me away. So that is really, uh, we had no freedom of speech. The other thing is, of course, the newspaper and the radio were completely controlled. And it was a lot of deceiving news. Now, we uh, did not have, of course, television. We didn't have internet. We had only radios and the newspaper. And that's where we got our information from. We were not allowed to say, to sing any foreign songs. Everything had to be German. And we couldn't use even words like jeans or American words, French words, and so on. Now the Germans go overboard and they use so many English words. Many times when I'm over there and I can't find exactly the German word, and uh, then I used the English word, and they said, oh, we use that too. So, um, so there was no freedom of speech and so ever. Now, Hitler wanted not only to control Germany, he wanted to control all Europe and maybe even go eventually beyond. And we do know that the first country he annexed is which country? Austria. Austria. Yeah. You know that from the sound of music from the film. Mm -hmm. And now why would that be the first country here next? Why? That's, that's where, where he was, was from. from. Number one, that's where he was from. A second thing is that um, he was an artist, but he was a very lousy artist. <laughs> and he was also a lousy student. So he applied in Vienna at the Academy of Arts, and he was turned down. And I have been told that that academy was headed by Jewish people. And I think at that time then he really started to hate the Jewish people. I think that's when it started. I'm not 100% sure, but that's what I have been told. Um, so the next country through that three-day three blitzkrieg was? Was Poland. Was Poland, okay, which he annexed. And um, as a matter of fact, I'm born in Poland with what's Germany at that time. I'm born in Posen. Poznan, is it now? Is it called? And, but it was German, and I'm 100% German. My, my parents were scientists in Poland. And uh, then, as I will tell you later on, my, my uh, father got drafted. He's an MIA. And my mother was drafted into the Ukraine. And I will tell you later on why she was drafted into the Ukraine. The next country was Alsace-Lorraine. Now, Alsace-Lorraine is a very important country because it's very rich in coal. And so that country has gone back between France and between Germany constantly. So it was French, then he annexed it, OK? Um, he fought also on other fronts. He fought in Holland. He fought in Belgium. He fought in France, he fought in Italy, and he fought also in Africa. 
towards the end of the war, he moved deeper into Russia. And we know, and I will tell you later what happened, that he was eventually defeated in Russia, in Stalingrad. Now, my life began during World War II. I was actually too young to grasp all the horror of the World War II. But my mother, she tells her story at the beginning of the book in very much details as she escaped from the Ukraine to West Germany. And it is a horror story. My mom never wanted to talk about the war. As so many older generations, they do not want to talk about uh, the war, um, or especially the war in, in uh, Germany. But I became a high school uh, teacher, senior high school, and I taught German literature. And so the students would all ask me, so many questions about Hitler. And they said, well, how come you couldn't kill that guy? <laughs> well, there are so many people attempted to kill him. And you know yourself that he always got away, maybe with a little scratch or something, OK? But there was also a student movement. And it was called Die Weiße Rose. And maybe you have read the book, The White Rose. And there was a student movement who uh, published a lot of leaflets. And at night, they would take suitcases full of these leaflets and get, uh, uh, distribute in the, in the subway in public places. But those students, they got all caught, and they were all killed. So there were a lot of different movements. But it was just very, very difficult during that time to really not be caught. Now, um, I start in the book, uh, the first part, which is called The East. And my mother finally wrote down her story. And it is a horror story. It's terrible. Then I was very, very uh, fortunate that her best friend, who also was drafted to the Ukraine, um, as scientists, she was a plant pathologist. My mom was a geneticist, animal husbandry, and, the, and they were drafted to the Ukraine by Hitler and another group of scientists. Now, you ask me, why the Ukraine? Well, Ukraine, there were a lot of German living. They were the Volksdeutsche, German people. And at the, beginning, um, at the beginning of the war, everything was good. Uh, my mother did it, uh, research. It, it, they showed the people, the Russian people, how to breed better, better animals. Uh, Gertrude, who was the plant patholo pathologist, she showed them how to uh, get better crops and so on. And um, that was, and I was very, very lucky that I, when I was in Germany and before Gertrude died and before my mom died, that I could take so much information down from Gertrude, the plant pathologist. I was sitting there with my tape recorder while she was speaking and while I was asking a lot of questions. So her part is also in the beginning of the book. Now. Um, my father, as I said, you know, he was drafted. Um, I don't even know my father because he was uh, drafted while I, just before I was born, OK? Uh, and he's missing in action. Of course, we assume he's dead. Uh, most women were drafted into ammunition plants because that's what Hitler needed, OK? I was uh, saying that in Ukraine, there were a lot of German people. And towards the end of the war, it was uh, my mothers and the scientists and everybody who was German to try to get out of the Ukraine before the Russians came in and try. Of course, Hitler needed more Germans to fight, more Germans to die. So they all the Germans were drafted. And some of them had to move to West Germany. 
Now, during that time, I was put into a children's home. Now, over there, the children's home, it's not just a place where you drop off a kid, but they are professional uh, pediatric nurses who take care of the children. It's actually a very, very good place. But I was very fortunate because I did not have to stay very long in that place. Because there was a lady and she lost her husband also in the war. He got shot and she had a little daughter and she was my age. And that daughter was crying so much and she was so sad because she lost her daddy. So this lady, she said, it would be very nice if he could find a playmate for her. So she came to that children's home and she found me and she took me in. And she was a very well-to-do lady. Her husband was a lawyer and she had a wonderful home. And Crystal, her daughter, and I, we became very good playmates. But also that did not last very long. Because in the winter of 44, 45, we all had to evacuate from Poznan. And the way they did this is that they, uh, imagine it's Cleveland or some, some town. OK, they had different collection places where this group from these suburbs, they all collect there. And these groups from that suburb, they collect there. And there were thousands and thousands of people. And you have seen the movie, The Fiddle on the Roof, at the end, how people escaped from, uh, uh, got out of the village. That's how we got out of the village. Uh, Crystal and I, we were only about four or five years old. We had knapsacks on the back. We had a sign around our chest, big sign, our names, and the place where we are going to go. And that was Berlin. Because my first foster mother, I called her mommy, she had a distant relative in Berlin. And that's where we are going to go to, all the way from Poznan, from Poland, or Posen, to Berlin. Now, the way we traveled is people grabbed suitcases, whatever they could carry. Uh, they, uh, some women had children wagon, baby carriages. Some others had some other carriages, wagons. We had some horses, we had some wagons. And whatever we could uh, take along, we, because we were hoping to get back soon. But it was minus 10 degrees. It was bitter cold. It was one of the coldest winter. And can you imagine people, old people especially, carrying heavy suitcases. They couldn't go that far anymore. They dropped the suitcases. But soon they couldn't even go anywhere. And they just sat there and they froze to death. We, Chris, uh, Chris, um, Crystal and I, we were very, very lucky because we were on top of a wagon and wrapped into blankets. And uh, so we were nice and cozy. We had our knapsacks where mommy put in jewelry. She put some money. She put in a set of warm clothes. And then, of course, we had our sign uh, around our neck. And on top of the knapsack, we had a teddy bear. So that's how we went. And it was really one of the coldest winters which we had at that time. I can remember, now, mommy rode everything. She was a beautiful rider. And she rode all the things in detail for me down. Our escape, which took three years. We went to Berlin, we went to Ch uh, first Czechoslovakia, then Berlin, then down to Austria, then to North Germany, wherever we could find somebody and make some kind of connection. But of course, nobody wanted a lady with two small children. 
what a bother that is. So we tried to talk to farmers to take us. It was, it was very, very difficult. Now, I inject a lot of special memories, which I can remember when we were running through the town of Dresden. And Dresden was just bombed, like most of the major cities, bombed terribly. We ran for the air raids were coming. And we were running for cover. And I remember I could see nothing but fire, flames, hearing the sirens. And I didn't want to go to bed anymore and sleep because of all that stuff I dreamt. And I remember also when we were in Berlin, we, the raids, air raids were coming. And of course, Berlin was leveled pretty much. The air raids were coming. We were running to a big bunker. And the bunker had thousands and thousands of people in there. We were mushed like sardines in there. My mommy was so afraid that she would lose us children. And we were in there for hours and hours, and sometimes a whole day. So no wonder I have claustrophobia. So, but anyway, so we were fleeing for three years from one place to another. We tried, you know, I hate to say that, but it's true. We stole wood from the farmers. We stole from the fields, we stole some potatoes, we stole some stuff which we could go so that we just could survive. And um, now after three years, my foster mother, she could not feed me anymore. And of course, if you have your own child, you take care of your own child and you give the other child away. So she had to give me away to another family. And I got into that family. I was skin and bones. They called me spider den uh, long leg because my legs were so skinny. I, was, I had rickets, hunchbacked. I was underfed, of course. And uh, I remember when I got into that home and the uh, grandmother, Oma, said to me, well, we'll take her. We don't know whether she will live or die, but we'll take her. Made a big impression on me. So, but anyway, now just to tell you how the situation was at that time. This family, well, the, there was no man in the house. He, the father, Oma's husband, died of a massive heart attack. And then Marta, who it, uh, it took me in, she was a spinster. And, um, but they had adopted a boy. And that boy came from a family from Munich. There were eight children. But the mother was a seamstress. And she could not take care of feed all these eight children. The, her husband got also killed in the war. So she gave all her children away, except kept two. So into this family came a boy. And he was legally adopted. And his name was Hans. And I grew up with Hans, whom I call my brother. And we are all same age, just two days apart. So we always celebrated birthdays and everything together. Now, I want to talk a little bit when the war ended. Germany was practically erased from the map. I mean, the big cities were all rubble. The railroads didn't work. Trans other transportation didn't work, you know? And it was the women who rebuilt the big cities, Hamburg, Berlin, München, Munich, and so on, of course, with the help of the Marshall Plan. But it was the women who built, because most men died in the war. They died, most men died in the bloodiest battle in Stalingrad which took eight months. And 
The German army ran out of ammunition. They ran out of food. They ran out of warm clothes. So they finally surrendered. And it was exactly on February the 2nd in 43. But Hitler's propaganda went on. And we were reading in the paper, oh, it is just a matter of months, maybe a year, and Germany will win the war. That's how the people got deceived. Now you know that uh, Hitler, he fought in France. You are familiar with the uh, Normandy invasion, which was called Operation Overlord. And you are familiar with D-Day, which was called Operation Neptune, where 160,000 troops crossed the English Channel. And 2 million Allied troops were in France by August 44. Now, the time after the war was really bad because we had no food. I was very fortunate because I lived in a small town. And there, at least it was a farming town. And we kids, we could help the farmers. And we got a, maybe a quart of milk for it, for the help. So I, we had a little bit of milk. And uh, then after the farmers harvested, we went out and gleaned. Hans we, and I, we had to glean. We dug up the potatoes, put them in a gunny, gunny sack, and put them in a cellar, root cellar, for the winter. We dug up rutabakers, we dug up sugar beets, we collected grain and ears of grain, and what we made out of it, of some grain we made, we ground it up and we made coffee out of it, awful stuff. And then some of it we dried, and we um, made flour out of it. We collected so many things, what we could find in the meadow. Spinach, uh, spinach watercress. Oh, in the woods we could find holunder, which is elderberry. We could find berries, uh, raspberries, blackberries. I was so good in finding mushrooms. We dried them, we uh, canned it, I mean, we had mushrooms galore. And we lived whatever we could find. And also wood, we had no wood to make a fire. You know, we all had these old fashioned hearths and we cooked with a hearth, we had to put uh, wood in there. So Hans and I, we had a little wagon and we were collecting the dried, uh, cones, the squirrels left the inside, and they made very good kindling fire. Then the woodcutters, they would uh, take the bark off of the uh, trees, and then they throw the bark on a pile. We collect that, we let it dry. Wonderful kindling fire. And we would gather twigs and wood so we could, uh, we could fire, uh, have enough for the winter. We also got from the government, we got all kinds of coal, and we had to uh, put that in the cellar for the winter. Um, oh, meat. We didn't have much meat. The dogs and the cats disappeared. <laughs> okay, I remember one time a horse in the marketplace died. And people came with pots and pans and bowls, and they ripped that horse apart that there was hardly anything left. Now, we were very fortunate because uh, the grandfather of this family who had passed away had left us a little land, piece of land. We had to go about three miles to feed the chicken. So we had a couple chicken, we had a couple geese, we had rabbits and we had a bee house. So we at least we had a little bit. And then we had a little garden. 
and uh, where we could plant a few things. So we were not as bad off as many people. But we kids, we had to work very, very hard. We had to cut wood. As soon as I came home from school, my foster mother said, oh, we don't need bright people. Work with your hands. So I had to put on an apron. I still love aprons today. And I had to cut wood and I had to knit socks for the whole family, gloves for the whole family. And uh, uh, we learned just about anything, how to sew, how to crochet. And we had to do a lot of work. Now, through a letter um, which went wrong, I, somebody, got hold of my name in my family, in grandfather's family. And that aunt, she asked my grandfather, who knew about my existence, nobody else knew about my existence, said, who is this Monica? And she found out, and she came, and she visited me. And when she saw in the conditions where I lived, we lived in a two-story house with seven families. We shared one toilet, which was an outdoor, indoor house. And we shared one wash kitchen, so we kept, could wash only every seven to eight weeks. And uh, the conditions were really bad. I mean, you know how close the houses are in Europe? They just have a little space in between. And that was the place where the garbage went. Now, we did really not have much garbage because we pretty much ate everything. But once in a while, you know, some lettuce spoiled or whatever it is. And I would press my nose against the window pane and watch those huge rats, and they were big, jumping from one side to the other, having leaves in their, their mouths and so on. So, this was a normal way. So, but when my aunt saw me, and she came from a very well-to-do family, because my grandfather, he's a famous uh, attorney. My uncles are all lawyers. And um, so they came, she came from a very good home. And she says, you've got to get out of here. This is terrible, the way you live. And we were happy, we didn't know anything different. And if you don't know anything different, you are happy, right? So she got me back to my family, to my grandfather. And my grandfather, because I spoke such a bad dialect, and if you know the Franconian dialect, which is very, very bad, I mean, it's, you can hardly understand the people. And I spoke that when I got to my grandfather who spoke that wonderful, high educated, high German. And he wouldn't speak to me for three days. And then finally I said to him, he was a little, he couldn't see very well. And he couldn't read the paper anymore. So he was sitting next to this high radio and listening to the news. And then finally, I tried in the high German to te uh, tell him, I said, can I reach you out of the paper a little bit? And he just went like this. So I tried in a very, I have a knack for languages. So I tried in the high German to read out of the paper. And he finally, he had to laugh because it must have sounded funny. And so it broke the ice. And I became eventually the, the favorite grand daughter of his. But anyway, and he helped me then to come to America. My mother already came in 1953, but she lost all her papers because during the war, her professors, they all died in the war. The university was no more at that time. So there were no papers, nothing. So she came to this country as a uh, in, into a family to take care of four d uh, teenagers who sponsored her and she did the cooking and dishwashing and everything till she made contact with a professor at the University of Minnesota. We came to Minnesota first 
And he helped her then. She had to go back to school, get her master's degree, get another PhD and in genetics. And so we both, at one time, we both went to school for some time. OK, I'm going to stop here because I want you to ask questions. And I know you're going to have many questions. Now, in my book, I'll write in details. I describe everything. The life I was as, as a teenager, which I had, which was horrible. But um, it was, uh, I look at it now as a tremendous education. And I learned a lot. And now you can put me in any part of Africa or India, and I can make it a go. And I was in those countries, too. Yeah? When you were born. Yeah? I was about, in, during the war, I was four or five years old. Yeah. OK. You said you were born in Poland. Yeah. Poland. Yeah. That's where my folks are from. But we're, and, and my mom's folks are from Serbia. We're Polish Serbian. Yeah. But I'm an American. So wouldn't you be Polish, not German now? I mean, you're Polish. Be a Polish citizen of Germany. No, there were at that time there were so many uh, Germans mm -hmm. in Poznan. As a matter of fact, my parents they were Germans, but they studied at the University of Poznan. Mm -hmm. But they were from Oldenburg, which is near Hamburg, near Bremen. Mm -hmm. But we were 100% po uh, uh, German. Yeah, I know that, but I mean. Where, where they were born at, or where you were born at, is generally what you were classified at. But I don't yeah, know but at that time, it was German, oh, because okay. Hitler annexed right. it, okay. remember? Yeah, yeah. So right. it was okay. German. Okay. So Thank you. I am. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Was you talking about the Ukraine? Yeah. yeah. Ukraine. My wife's father and family came from Ukraine in 1917. Oh, yeah. They left. That was the, the, the 1917, that was the uh, Russian Revolution. Yeah. Yes, yes. They got out. Yeah, they got out on time. Yeah. Yes? I was just wondering, the grandfather you're talking about, is that the grandfather of the mother of the son? Yeah. The grandfather? It's the father of my mom. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because you mentioned your mom and your foster mom, too, at one time, so I was just wanting to make sure I got it. Yeah. He was a lawyer? Yeah, he was an attorney. Okay, and um, your uh, mother, why did, I know you said part of it is that she had animal, animal husbandry genetics. Um, why is it that Hitler sent him to Ukraine? He originally, he wanted the Ukraine, the people to have, see, Ukraine is a very important country because it is the breadbasket of Russia. And it has agriculture, and it has a lot of minerals. And so Hitler, of course, was very much interested of getting the Ukraine. On top of it, there were so many Germans living also. Yeah, that's why. And she was actually lucky that she was drafted to the Ukraine. And at the beginning, everything was wonderful. I saw all her photo albums and everything, how they mixed with the people and they uh, uh, had uh, really good research and showed them how to breed better animals and do better farming and things like that. It was good, except then when the Russians started moving in. And that's when the Russians started coming in, they all left and you were with her then. And, and I was not with her when she was a scientist drafted. I was put into that children's home. Okay, that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How was it when you had up with your mother? It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> she's a good person, but she's the opposite of I. I'm I was raised very conservative. You know? And she is the ultra liberal person, bra burning person. Okay? So when I first came she said, Oh, I, you can drink, you can do anything in America. You can drink, you, here's the whiskey, you can smoke, you can do anything. And so she said, you know, and I wasn't used to this. 
And I did smoke just maybe half a year, year or something, and I threw my cigarettes and never touched them. And uh, we would sit at the, uh, on the weekend, she'd buy a case of beer and finish the 24 bottles. <laughs> that was in Minnesota? Yeah, she came to Minnesota because her sponsor. At that time, you know, my mom applied, it's, it's ironic too, for Africa, for Australia, and for America too. It's because Germany, there were no jobs available. But she had to wait only four years to, to come to America. And um, then, you know, you needed a sponsor. You could not come to America just like that. So she had, from her hometown, a lady, a friend who would sponsor her. Okay. I came also to Minnesota in the deepest winter, I remember. Oh, I thought my eyeballs would freeze. I had to walk to school. My mom said, you are so stupid, you don't know any English. She put me after one week into high school. I was a little older than the other kids, but it was the best thing because I really learned English very, very fast. And in five months, it was, I came in December, cold months, and I graduated with a group in May, and I had so good grades because I had to take math, trigonometry, I was way ahead in math. I took English and we had to memorize vocabularies. Well, What's I can that? do that at home. Okay, then I had to take social studies and we studied Russia. I know all about Russia. I took art because I'm good in water coloring. And uh, the only subject which was very difficult was American history. But it was required to graduate. So, and I had a spinster, and she reminded me too much of my second foster mother, who was so strict. And I said, I don't need another one like this. But I studied real hard, but I got a C in, uh, in history, but everything else was A's. But I got admission into the uh, University of Minnesota, but I had to take that SAT test. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And I did a lousy job on that one because it was multiple guess, and I don't know how to do multiple guess. We have to write essays when we take tests, and so on. So I did very poorly. So then they said, well, what are we going to do with you? <laughs> we'll put you on probation. And if you have uh, a B average, and I almost had an A average, because I took easy subjects like French, <laughs> mathematics, <laughs> but I was way ahead. And uh, then I, I was transferred to liberal arts, and then I got a couple of degrees. Minnesota. University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, St. Paul. You live there? Yeah. I lived there, we so lived there 17 years. I lived in yeah, nice, nice town, very nice town when, except cold. When you were a little girl and you were worried about the bombs bombing you, right. who was bombing you? During the night, it was usually the British people who bombed, and they bombed recklessly. During the day, it was the Americans and the Allied, they bombed, but they usually chose their targets. And do you know that little town, Rothenburg, up there, Tauber, you call it Rothenburg, but Rothenburg, due to an American who signaled up to the Americans, said, please do not bomb this town because it is so beautiful from the Middle Ages. And that's why Rothenburg was not bombed. It's still a beautiful little town. And I'm quite sure some of you have visited it. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. Excuse me. You said that uh, you came home from school. How soon after the end of the war did they begin the, uh, the education again? And what were the facilities and, and so forth? Right, right. They did, right after the war, they did start education. It was very, very primitive because many people didn't have food. So we had a soup kitchen. And I remember it was nothing but a big kettle 
and we had soup and we brought our own dish and we got at least a soup. What we used for writing, we had black boards uh, and with chalk. And that's what we, we learned on, on, on uh, in school. And the classes were put together with, uh, like for instance, we had always two classes together with one teacher. Yeah. I hope this isn't personal. That's okay. You know about where your father, where was he at when he was killed in that war? We don't know we don't anything know where, yeah. about the father because he was drafted immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't even, it didn't even know that I was born. Mom, they wanted to get married, mm -hmm. but you know, because they never got married, I'm actually a child out of wedlock. Oh. And you, you, this question might come up, my grandfather, because he had such a high position, he said I to my mom, she told him about it, and she said, I do not want anybody to know and ever to see that child, so that shame does not enter my face. Okay. But those were the times yeah. at that time. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. my mother, she said, I never told anybody about it. My, my wife's brother was in Berlin. He married a, lady, a woman from Berlin. We had a family in the Ritman there that had a store. They were, she was from Germany, but she was from the lower part or from the southern part of Germany. So when uh, my brother-in-law and his wife came up from South Carolina, we got them together and they tried to talk German. One was low and was, they gave up and talked English. They couldn't understand. It is very difficult, yeah. you know, and now with my dialect, even, you know, we have so many different states in Germany and each state has their own dialect. And the Northern Germans cannot sometimes understand the Southern Germans. Now, I'm very fortunate I can understand all the different languages because I traveled and moved around a lot. So, yeah. I was in the Army and I spent 17 and a half months in Bavaria. Oh, yeah. Augsburg in Germany. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did the people like your grandparents who were fairly well off, they had a much easier time after the war then? Did they have, they were well off, they had after the war what? Did they have a much easier time after the war? Yeah, now the very west in Germany, they didn't have the hard times as the middle Germany and the eastern part because the Brits were mostly in northern Germany. Now, my fa grandfather, they had to leave the house for some time and live in the ministerium in the government building because the British people, they took over our house and they damaged it a lot. And, um, um, but then later on, they got back to their house again, yeah. And, and Oldenburg, which is a garden city, was not damaged very much. So they were very fortunate. You mentioned that the one place you lived at, they had their farm. Yeah. Yeah, that was West Germany. You know, at that time we didn't have East and West Germany yet. So they, the farmers, they could use, uh, they could keep their farms. But then later on, when the wall went up, Everything from the East Germany, from their farms, it was taken by the government. Only East Germany, yeah. Right, right. But we were right at the border of uh, Czechoslovakia and East Germany, Middle Germany, yeah. What was the name of that town you said that Hitler said not to be bombed? Rothenburg. You pronounce it Rothenburg. But it's Rotenburg. I asked if we were in a community. I was in a visiting community. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Sure. Uh, throughout history, Germany quite often gets overpopulated. And because of that, the immigrants leave like this. You're talking about the uh, uh, Deutsche Volk. Volksdeutschen, yeah. Volksdeutschen. Well, they were military colonies for the Tsar. Like, and, uh, the movement, though, all through the wars, you know, like uh, the religious wars. Yeah. That they knew the Germany of population, but then they refilled. And so that's why the Germans moved all over the place, because the wars. Is 
exactly. Like my people from the Australian Empire. And you could have a village three miles down the road, they'd be Lutheran, and this village would be Catholic. Right. They might be Germans, these would be Hungarians, these would be Slovaks, yes. yeah. these would be Czechs, and so on. So there was a scattering all through that area, mixing. So and then you're talking about Poznan and stuff, well, that transferred from Germany to Poland and vice versa. Right, so exactly. Yes, and even the place I lived, you know, in middle Germany with my second foster mother, in that house there were several refugees and they were from, one was from Yugoslavia. So they were from different places. They just tried to come over. Yugoslavia again were a lot of German people. I knew a fellow that was in the Yugoslavian Air Force in 1940. Yeah. He actually went to Austria. Right. A lot of them went to Austria You're first. Talking about the bombing, a woman that I stayed with for a while, uh, uh, Hydro Morse, on the Oslo Fjord. B-17s were dropping, and she saw the planes, and she was swimming in the uh, factory's water pool, cooling pool, and so because it was warm there from the fjord. And she said the bombs started coming down, <laughs> and she swam to shore, and she was running, and the bombs went across the factory. It was coming up towards her and then they stopped, you know, a few hundred yards from the town. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yes. Did you ever reconnect with your first foster mother? With my first foster, yes, I did. And she felt for many years, she felt so bad that she had to give me away. You know, she really suffered under that. But we were very close, we had very close contact. She only passed away last year. Oh, yeah, wow. she was in her 90s. Yeah. What about, what about the, uh, uh, my second foster mother, she died very, very early um, of kidney poisoning. She always took pills, 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 pills. When I got there, you know, I, uh, she says, oh, you have a headache or what? You got to take pills, pills, pills. And so she died of kidney. She poisoned herself, as a matter of fact, with pills. What about Crystal? Crystal and I, we are very good friends. She would love to come to America, but she hates to fly. She's afraid of flying. But whenever we are over there, we visit her. And Hans, my brother, yes, he came to America. And uh, he doesn't know any English. He has a lovely home, lovely children and everything. And we, whenever we go to uh, Germany, we stop there and we visit. Yes, very close. Yeah, Hans is in Germany. Yeah. A lot of high school students now their whole four years might get maybe an hour or two to go to World War II. It's usually on subtleties like the difference between the German and the Pacific and things like that. If you, had, if you had a short time with a high school student and wanted, wanted them to know one or two things that they needed to know about World War II, what, what thing would you want? Well, number one, enjoy that you live in a free country, that you live in a democracy, and uh, where you have the freedom. But the freedom is not free. You need to appreciate the freedom. You need to appreciate what you have in this country. You need to make the best of it and work hard nowadays. People just don't work that hard anymore. Be, uh, when I came to this country, I tried to associate with people who are brighter than I am because I wanted to learn from them. What makes him tick, I can tick also. So in other words, you know, we try to learn um, as much as we can from the other culture. Now, when I came, I didn't know any German. There was no button to push for German, okay? I had to learn the language. And by golly, you know, you learn the language fast if you have to. And you work, I had to prove myself to be a good citizen. I, you had to be here five years at least. I had to have, take, pass a government exam. I had to have two witnesses who can say I'm a good, good person, come with me and vouch for me and so on. And, and I had to prove myself that I am worthy to be in this country. And I still think America is the best country to be in. 
And I remember several years ago, many years ago, my husband had the opportunity to set up a, an industry somewhere, anywhere in the world. And uh, we sat down, do we want to go to Germany? Do we want to go, he's from India. Do we want to go to India? Do we want to go uh, to Africa? Because we've traveled in a lot of things. Norway, the Scandinavian countries are beautiful, and so on. And then we still said, no, let's stay in America. America is still the best country. If you are working hard, it still has a lot of opportunities. I, in Germany, I wouldn't have gone probably to university. I had an opportunity. I said, well, I'm going to, this is a good chance. I'm going to buckle down. I'm going to study. And then I became a teacher. And later on, I went into the industry to become a treasurer of a company in Frankenzell in Fichtelgebirge. That is, yeah, in Fichtelgebirge, which is near Hof, Bayreuth, Bamberg, real close. Yeah, I started you talking about Rothenburg. My uncle and grandfather moved to the Messerschmitt from Bamberg. And they didn't bomb Bamberg either during the Second World War because they had no industry. Yeah. Messerschmitt wanted to build their aircraft factory in Bamberg. Yeah. But they moved it to Augsburg. So yeah. And, and why don't you like a Franken accent? <laughs> well, I don't mind. That's what I grew up with, but uh, other people mind. <laughs> yes? Where was your mom in 10 years from, uh, more or less like when Russia started to you know, uh, come into the country of Germany and 53 when she came to Minnesota? She tried to get jobs. She tried to find jobs, yes. She was in Western Germany, yeah, in the West, and she tried. She was a, um, on a big estate. She was a secretary. She just took jobs wherever she could. But it wasn't what she really wanted. And you know, the funny thing is that she ended up in Africa later on. When Nixon came into administration, he cut out a lot of uh, jobs in the biological science and in the uh, um, um, uh, doctor, uh, uh, biological is usually or agriculture too, so there were no jobs to be had. And then she applied for again Australia and Africa, and she went to Africa. And she was 10 years in Africa, in Nigeria. As a professor at the University of Ibaran. Yeah. Pardon me? What was the year of the invasion to your area? Was it Russia or was it you were speaking of Germany? It was generally Russia. And you know, people were so afraid of the Russian because they were brutal. They raped the women and they just killed, merciless. And what year was that? That was 1944. 44, the winter of 44, 45. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Duperstein? Yeah? Zweibier? Zweibier? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any, any, any other? I have uh, some books here if you are interested in it. Uh, the bookstore sells them, not here, the bookstore in Florida sells them for 20 bucks. I sell them for $15. I would sign them. And uh, so if you're interested in it, uh, I will sign some books. There's a lot of detail in there. I just gave you just a little summary. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Oh. As, a, as a small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank this you. Is the, this is the do it all library set. This has everything you'll ever need in there. In there. <laughs> there you go. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.